great welcome makes a merry feast. Good morning to one and all present here. On the behalf of the Department of Information Technology, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all for the guest lecture on the topic Emerging Technologies for Digital Transformation. It's my pleasure to extend a warm welcome to eminent speaker of the day, Dr. Saravanan Alaif Muttaya, Professor at Multimedia University in Malaysia. Welcome to Principal Sir. I would like to extend my warm welcome to a person who always encourages and thinks for the well-being of the student, Dr. M. Maleshwari Ma'am, the Head of IT Department. Once again, I welcome each and every one present here and hope that you will have a great time ahead. Thank you. Thank you one and all. It gives immense pleasure to introducing Dr. Saranan Alice Muttaya sir. Dr. Muttaya sir is currently a full professor in Multimedia University, Cyber Jaya, Malaysia, where teaches and conducts research in the area of research predictive analysis, AI machine learning, ontologies, blockchain, cryptocurrencies, cyber security, data analytics, advanced databases, data science, semantic web algorithms, web 4.0, semantic databases, knowledge management, green technology, computer networks, programming, research methodology and management information systems. Dr. Muttaya served as Dean of Graduate School of Management in Multimedia University until March 1st, 2018 and is now a full-time member of Research Institute for Data Enterprise. His corporate experience includes serving as a Systems Analyst for IBM World Trade Corporation to develop financial accounting systems for enterprise-wide accounting applications. Prior to that, he had worked for Arthur Anderson as an auditor, he has consulted for numerous entities such as CPA Australia, CAMA UK, AACPA USA, Global Training Consulting UK, EON, PNB, OUM Malaysia, MMU Synergy, University Malaya, Maybank, UMCCED, MAK PEM, Pacific Tech, Sri Lankan Ministry of Higher Education, Telgroup, Telecom, Telecom uh, Malaysia, Commonwealth Telecommunication Organization UK and PNG Telecom. Dr. Muttaya holds a PhD in Information Technology. He is a Fulbright Scholar and also a CADS Inter Senior Research Fellow, a research outfit based on Washington DC USA. Dr. Muttaya holds 12 IPs, Gold and Silver Awards in ITEC and Pensilta. He has published more than 100 articles in journals, books, book chapters, workshops and conferences. He is also a frequent keynote speaker at research summits, conferences and workshops. Dr. Muttaya is a Stanford University certified design thinking training and as well as a King's MBTTT certified trainer. He is also a branding ambassador for CIMA UK and runs PTT workshops all over the globe for CMA strategic case study examinations. He is also visiting professor and external PhD examiner to a number of universities, local and abroad. In 2015, Dr. Muttaya had a honor of being a keynote speaker at the Energy Conference in Colombo, Sri Lanka with the late President of India, Dr. A. V. J. Abdul Kalam. Mr. Muttaya also served as a Chief Malaysia Research Assessment Internal Auditor in Multimedia University. Thank you, sir. Now, now I would invite Dr. Saranen to deliver a talk on emerging technologies for digital transformation. Yeah. And uh, thank you, madam. Uh, and uh, I'm really very privileged and happy to be here to see all the young future leaders of this country. Um, before I start, I'd just like to 
share a little bit of my journey. Um, it took me 22 years to realize actually what is it that I'm doing in in the university. 22 years I've been in the university. I'm still trying to ask myself what is it that I'm doing in the university because there's so much money to be made in industry. Okay, so once you see the money in industry, you will never want to come to a university. So everyone asks me this question, why are you in the university? Why are you still there? Money is good outside. What are you doing here? So I also ask myself this question every day I wake up. Why am I here? What am I doing? But every time I see an audience like this, uh, suddenly I get re reprogrammed. See, okay, this is my purpose, right? Uh, of course you can make a lot of money, but you're not going to get an audience, young people, the, the future leaders of the nation. You're not going to have an opportunity to talk to them, to inspire them, to guide them, to tell them at least what to look forward to. So I think every time I see an audience like this, it gives me hope, okay, I'm in the right place, you know. Uh, and, and money is not really everything in, in, in life. Uh, so 22 years going, um, and uh, I don't know, a few more years to go, maybe I hope. But uh, uh, my mission is to be basically help all of you to at least think about where you want to be, you know, five, ten years from now. Okay? Some of you may be thinking about data science, some of you may be thinking about CGI, some of you may be thinking about security, information security, some of you may be thinking about blockchain. Now, in your hearts, right? In every one of you, in your hearts, you have something that you are thinking about and that idea will not really become crystal clear unless you start, you know, seeing some of these things. So, today's talk is about four emerging technologies that is going to revolutionize and change the world. And after this talk, I'm hoping that maybe one of these four you will choose to change your idea about where you want to be five, ten years from now and start working towards learning everything that is possible to become a subject matter expert in that area. Okay. So the first one I will be talking about is blockchain. Then I will move on to talk about uh, a new emerging area in encryption. I uh, will also talk a little bit about um, IoT, which I think most of you already know. I will touch a little bit about IoT as well. So, so the four areas that I will I will touch on, and hopefully you get excited and you say, okay, from now on I want to, you know, go on this path. I want to choose IoT or I want to choose, you know, uh, blockchain. Okay, so that is the idea of this uh, talk. So I hope all of you are excited. Are you excited? Yes. Sir. Okay, so let's start. Let's start the show, okay? So uh, let's go on to the slides next. Do you want me to go through? Okay. So this is just a bit background about myself. Let's skip that. Uh, we'll skip this. This already been uh, in a very lengthy way mentioned by our... His name is Klaus Schwab. Klaus Schwab. And... Uh, you know, today we talk about IR 4.0, right? IR 4.0. What happened? Fire. 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 <laughs> I, I just started and it's already burning. It's a good sign. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so, uh, so we we'll let the siren calm down for a while. Let's see. Okay, it's coming down. Right. So, Klaus Schwab. He was at the World Economic uh, Forum, World Economic Conference or Forum is held uh, in Sweden every four years. And at that time, Mr. Klaus said that uh, there's something new coming. He says this is going to be a revolution. He called it the Industrial Revolution 4.0. So let's, let's ask ourselves, what was the Industrial Revolution 1.0? Does anybody remember? Industrial Revolution 1.0 was when we first started uh, thinking about using machines 
when we first started thinking about using some sort of machine, the machine may not be very sophisticated. Simple, simple things. So irrigation, using some machine, what you know, uh, uh, water, irrigation of water and all that, some technology, even in construction, some small technology that became IR 1.0. Okay? Some way, because we were using horses and animals, right? From there, we started moving slowly to some mechanical thing. It may not be great, but oh yes, now we have some mechanical thing. So we didn't have wheels, now we have wheels. So like your, you know, your bullock cart, you have the wheel there. So there's some innovation taking place. Some way to, for us to, you know, uh, improve uh, how we will yield, how we will farm, how we will travel, uh, transport and all this started changing. So no more riding uh, elephants and, and horses and, 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 and cows. Now we started having some form of some sort of a remote way, you can say, improvement. That was IR 1.0. Then came IR 2.0, where men started learning how to use machine in a more uh, intense way. So, you know, things like mechanical engineering and all that became very important during that time. So today, do we talk about mechanical engineers anymore? I mean, is it a very important course in the university? Everyone wants to do data science, right? Nobody wants to do mechanical engineering. But at that time, engineers were becoming a very important part of, you know, steam engines were being developed, right? So you are developing steam engines, we are developing engines with cars, automobiles, 1904, Henry Ford. So he came out the first car, right? So we were slowly starting to learn how to build locomotives, engines and all that. That's IR 2.0. Then came IR 3.0, where we got more into automation and things like RPA, robotic process automation became important. So like, you know, you don't have to uh, control the, the, you know, light switch on, switch off. Now you have, you know, uh, uh, sensors that do all this job for you, right? So it became automated, okay? Like the toll gate. You don't have human beings collecting money from the toll. Now you have a pass, you can just drive through. So more automation happened uh, in banking, in finance, in transportation, in all these areas. So IR 3.0. Then this guy, when he said IR 4.0, people didn't know what he was talking about. So in IR 4.0, he's trying to say that the world in the future will have no human intervention anymore. Everything is going to be digital. It will be a machine-run, machine-managed world. Something like uh, Star Wars. You know, like machines will manage everything. Human beings are supposed to do what they are created for. But we also don't know what we'll be created for, right? We're like, what are we created for? What are we here for? Okay, human beings have the capacity to think. You are built for a greater purpose. Now just imagine the girl who's sitting in the toll booth from you know nine o'clock in the morning, six o'clock in the evening, you know collecting money and you know paying, giving change. Do you think human beings were created for that, or will be created for a greater purpose? Definitely, we were created for a greater purpose. We are supposed to be able to use these machines to automate. So, if you follow the story of IR 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, .0, and now to 4.0. The objective is always the same. We want better productivity, better yield. And, and find a way how to automate it. So, IR 4.0 is here already. It's here. It has come. So, when you talk about 5G, when you talk about Internet of Things, when you talk about uh, things like uh, blockchain, they are all based on the idea of IR 4.0. So, the four technologies that I'm going to share with you are based on principles of IR 4.0. So even if you don't know what IR 4.0 is, at least you know blockchain is an example of that. 5G is an example of IR 4.0. Okay? So immersive technology again is part of IR 4.0. So you will have that idea. Okay? So even if you don't know the definition of IR 4.0, never mind. You know the man who mentioned this, Klaus Schwab, and uh, that term has become very, very popular. So I'll just quote this guy once again. He says, we stand in a technological, bring of technological revolution. Uh, watch this word very carefully. 
He's saying technological revolution that will fundamentally alter the way we live, work, relate one another. And he says in scale, scope and complexity, the transformation will be unlike anything that we have experienced before. Unlike anything that we experienced before. This word here? Unlike anything humankind has experienced before. That means you would have never seen it. Okay? So we we'll look at some some strategic technological revolutions. So the first thing I want to introduce you to is this thing called the Dhaka hype cycle. How many of you have seen this graph? How many have you seen this? No, nobody has seen this, okay? Which is good. Okay? Uh, this is basically uh, a life cycle of emerging technology. So if you want to know what technology is going to be hot, you see, what you are learning today will become obsolete in four years. It's not going to be relevant when you graduate. Correct? True? Do you, all, do you all believe in that? Do you know that? Or do you believe in that? That what you learn today is going to be obsolete four years from now? You will have a piece of paper, but uh, you won't have much technical knowledge because technology is changing very rapidly. Especially for you IT, computer science people. You have to constantly be you know, up to date. So what I have advice for you is that focus on these red bubbles. See the red bubbles here? I want you to focus from today onwards. These four these are the four areas that I'll be talking about. Okay? So these four areas is what the Gartner people, the consulting company have said these are going to be the emerging technologies for IR 4.0. So if you focus in these four areas, you will at least have job security for the next 20 years. So that is why I'm sharing this with you. Everyone okay so far? So let's look at the first one. This is about homomorphic encryption. I'll talk about this. Industry clouds. Then there's something called decentralized finance. FinTech is also going to be very, very hot. So all of you who are studying in computer science, try to understand a little bit about finance and FinTech because your skill will be required in that domain. Um, the finance, the banking, uh, the investment people are going to come to you. Okay? So things like uh, payment systems, e-wallets, blockchain, cryptocurrency, crypto assets, they are all going to be very, very hot. If you don't know anything about finance and, and, and banking, and you stay in your cocoon of, of, of computer science without knowing what's happening in that world, you will not get a job. You will be obsolete. So take some interest. So I will talk a little bit about blockchain and fintech. Just to show you that there's something called decentralized finance. This decentralized finance is basically the blockchain. Okay? But when you see this graph, it's very confusing where to start, right? Where to start? So I've already done the work for you. I've highlighted for you these four areas. The next one here is generative AI. We'll talk about generative AI shortly. This is also another emerging area that is very, very hot. Okay? So if you look at this graph, all these things are on an upward trend, correct? Can you see? The only one that's already matured is NFT. NFT is also under decentralized finance. NFT is part of decentralized finance. Okay? Non-fungible tokens. Again, decentralized identity, decentralization. So in the concept of IT or even databases, you have done a course on database, right? So there are two types of database, right? You have a centralized database and you have something called a decentralized database. So what's the difference between centralized and decentralized? Any idea? Why decentralized? Why decentralized is important? Any any anybody has any idea about this? Yes, no? Not sure? Not very sure. Not very sure, right? Okay. Alright. So you see, uh, when you, when you think about this concept of decentralized, you're basically, when you put everything, let's say you have a one server, right? And you keep everything on this one place. What will happen? Your resources very quickly will run out. Okay? Do you think Google is supporting you using one server or multiple servers in a, across a server farm? Multiple servers across a server farm. Why? 
because you need backup, you have limited resources, you have more servers to support is better. So things like cloud and all, all these concepts that we are talking about today under you know AWS, uh, cloud services, uh, Amazon, uh, all these guys, Google, they all are basically using a framework which is decentralized, not centralized. And this has been a story last 30 years. Okay, it's nothing new. But the concept of decentralized is now becoming more prevalent because people are talking about things like blockchain, which I will share with you shortly. Okay, so this this concept of decentralized fabric, NFT, are also linked here. But if you see in this graph, all these are on the upward trend. This one has matured, matured, and then you can see a downward trend, and then you can see things start to plateau after a while. So any technology for the matter, it will be always in the upward trend, and then it will reach a peak, and then go in the downward trend, and then some new technology will come, and then it will start going up again. Okay. But this graph that I am showing you, is worth for at least about 20 years. Okay? So this pattern is what's going to happen in the next 20 years. So next 20 years will be probably about 40, I think, right? So I think enough for 20 years, career development enough. When you reach 40, you see me again. If I'm still alive, I'll tell you what to do for the next 40 years. <laughs> now for now, I'll be your astrologer for 20 years. Okay? So this is what you need to focus on next 20 years. So, industrial cloud, homomorphic encryption, uh, decentralized finance concept, remember this concept, decentralized, okay, blockchain, and then things like generative AI and NFTs, these are going to be very, very important, okay. So, if you look at this color here, you will see yellow, I mean, the, the, the LCD project is not so good, so the light blue color you cannot see, these are light blue, light blue, light blue, you cannot see but the dark blue colors you can see. So if you look here at the legend at the bottom, these dark blue items here, they have listed, Gartner has listed that they will be very hot in the next five to 10 years. You can't see, I'm, I'm sure the people at the back there, not possible for you to see, so it's very tiny on the slide, okay? So I'll just tell you, these dark blue ones that I've circled, this one is light blue, but uh, here are two light blue and one dark blue. So basically these technologies that I highlighted are going to be hot in the next 5, 10 and even up to about 15 years. So from today's, today, uh, this was uh, predicted in 2021. So from last year, today and the next 15 to 20 years, these are going to be very hot. So whatever project that you are doing for your final year and all that, make sure you look up these things and do a project on these things you know, uh, and try to delve deeper into these topics. So today I will give you some uh, idea about these four emerging technologies. Hopefully you get inspired, maybe you get inspired, maybe you will fall asleep, I don't know. But whatever happens, if you get inspired, then I'm hoping that I'm going to change your mindset to become that expert in that area and your career will launch, you know. So don't put in your resume all these weird, weird things. I know Python programming, no big cash. Okay? Don't put in your resume things that are not relevant. Because by the time you graduate, all that you are going to write there, I can tell you now, sir, half of it you will not be to read. We will say it's not relevant. But this will be very relevant, very hard. Okay? Um, Let's start with blockchain. Are you guys ready? Yes. The first item. Okay. So blockchain basically is about provenance and trust. Uh, it's a technology that helps you to make, manage provenance. Uh, I know it's a very difficult word, provenance. Many English speaking people also don't know what provenance is. So I will explain to you what provenance is. Okay. So for example, uh, let's talk about family tree. Family tree. You are this individual, you came from a mother and father. This mother and father came from another pair of mother and father, right? Must be, right? <laughs> then they came from somewhere, 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 and there's a whole lineage, family lineage. Okay? How far can you trace your family lineage today? 
How many generations? One, two, three, four. Four. Maximum four. Okay, this gentleman here said maximum. I didn't say, he said maximum four generations you can trace. Okay? That's very good. Actually, four is very good already, right? It's quite good. Four. But if you ask generally people, they'll say three maximum. After that, I don't know, sir, I don't know where I came from. I don't know. Like for instance, me. Take my myself for example, I am fifth generation. Uh, South Indian descent. My great grandparents landed in Malaysia in 1848. I don't know how they came. Maybe by ship or I don't know how. You know, back then we didn't have planes. So maybe they came by ship and not during the British, you know, empire. British saw a lot of Indian people in India. So they needed labor. Took them and threw them in the fields. Uh, to build the railway and all that. So I came from, that's how I ended up in Malaysia. And I'm fifth generation. Okay? So, until today, until today, right, I'm dying to find out actually who am I, where I came from. I don't know which part of India. I'm really, I'm really very interested. You know, I always have this very late night discussions with my professor friend here, Professor Ramesh, who's sitting here. Every night we will discuss. I said, you know, sir, I really, really want to know. Actually, who am I? Where did I come from? I, you know, three, I know three generations, but I want to go further. You know, at least visit the, the place they actually came from. You know, because this provenance is very important, right? Why is it important to know who you are, where you came from? I'm not talking about the who you, who I am, the spiritual thing. I'm not talking about that. Okay, who am I and all that? You know, the Ramana Maharishi stuff. I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about who you are in your lineage, your provenance. Where did you come from? Why is it important? Because if your father had diabetes, you will have diabetes. If your grandfather died early or had some DNA defect, you will also carry it because that's what provenance is all about. You inherit and in computer science, you learn about in Python and all this programming in Java, you learn about inheritance, right? What is inheritance? It's provenance. Why is it so important? Well, don't reinvent the wheel. The libraries are already there. Just re-include those libraries. Don't have to reinvent the wheel. So provenance is important. Even from a simple concept of inheritance that you have learned in, in programming, right? In object-oriented programming, right? We talk about inheritance, right? What is inheritance? Provenance. Why is provenance important? Today, there's only one way of tracking this provenance. It's called DNA analysis. So if I analyze your DNA and I analyze the marker of your DNA, I will know you came from which place, maybe from Africa. They all say we all came from some part of Africa. That's what they say. Everybody in this world. They say we are 98% in terms of DNA. We are 98% the same. There's only 2% that makes us different. Can you imagine? We are 98% alive. There's only 2% that makes it different. So your blue color eyes, your blonde hair, your, your, you know, your, your, your height, your weight, and all those things is only 2%. So if 2% can make so much of difference, we should think about what is the 98% that makes us all of us similar, right? Okay? So it's something that, that inheritance is very important. That's the principle in programming, right? In object programming, fundamental principle, but we never talk too much about that. Today, today all the IT guys sat together and thought about this and said, how can we develop a technology that will help us with problems? And blockchain was born. Blockchain was born because we had this idea of capturing provenance in everything. Provenance in what? Provenance in your DNA. Provenance in, for example, land title. Someone gave you a piece of land. Your father gave you a piece of land. And there are paper documents. But the paper documents or the paper trail is not very, not very correct. Right? And you can, people are faking documents today. Right? Your land, somebody will fake the document and sell it. Isn't it? So we don't have provenance. We want provenance of the movement, the money trail. 
There's a lot of money, black money, moving from this country to that country, that country coming here. That's why your uh, Prime Minister, Mr. Modi, decided to do demonetization. Why? Because he wanted to have accountability of how much of our money is floating in the black market. He wanted to know. Okay? Because people are using this money for crimes, you know, for uh, starting wars and all these things. So he wanted to know how many Indians are financing civil wars across the world. You want to know. So when the money comes back, you say, this money is no value after 12 midnight today. So all of a sudden, the money is coming back. But we did not have provenance to know where the money went in the first place and how the money went then. We don't have this paper trail, money trail, we don't have. Because it's all moving through what we call a there's a, there's a very uh, interesting service called the Kurvi service. <laughs> Have you all heard of Havala and Kurvi? Uh, money is moving from place to place where there is no proper documentation or that. So we don't want all these things to happen. So provenance is very important, guys. Not only to know who you are, where you came from, from a DNA aspect, but provenance is also important when you give someone citizenship. Provenance is also important when there is a transaction of a land deed. Provenance is also important to, again, money trail. Provenance is basically important in every single aspect. And everywhere people can bluff, and there is zero trust, you need provenance. So imagine you are buying a motorcycle or an automobile, a car today. There is an odometer in the car, right? If the odometer says, let's say it's a, it's a second-hand, a, a, a pre-owned car, pre-owned vehicle, and the odometer says 25,000 kilometers, will you believe that, that, that number? Could have someone modified the odometer and sell the car to you? Is it possible? It's possible, right? Is there any way for you to check the validity of that odometer? There is no provenance, that's what I'm trying to say. We are living in a world of Wild Wild West, cowboys, everyone's a cowboy, you know, everyone takes everyone for a ride. There are just so many people who are cheating and bluffing all over the world. You want to know the car that you bought, who was the first owner? Is the warranty still, uh, you know, valid or is it void? Has the car been through a flood, like recently in Bangalore, many cars went underwater. You might have ended up buying a car that went underwater. But will you know or not? What you are getting yourself into. So is provenance important or not? Yes or no? Yes, sir. It's very important. And there is no technological solution for this yet. And we have this breakthrough now, which is the blockchain that helps you with this problem. So remember this. We the technologists are problem solvers. We are not here to show you some fancy technology and walk away. No, that's not our goal. We want to solve the real problem that you have. What is the real problem that you have right now? Provenance. That's your problem. So we want to solve your problem. And this was born, this technology was born, which is called the blockchain technology. Okay, so technology number one, I just gave you a like a preview. Now we will go deeper. Is the preview okay or any 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 questions? So far, okay? Okay. So, two issues here. Number one, trust. That's one problem that we are trying to solve. Okay? And secondly, we want to solve the problem of accountability. Whenever you have a problem with accountability, and you have a problem with trust, like at the example that I give you, you need a solution. What's the solution? Today, what do we have? You are learning so many subjects, right? 28 credits every semester. Did any subject teach you about accountability and trust? No. no. That's the problem. So you are not industry ready. That's why I'm here. To fill in the gap. To at least explain to you, start thinking about these things. Okay? So all of you must thank Mr. Ramesh because he is the one who introduced me and brought me over here. So he's helping you to see the real world. Okay? So guys, first, I'll give you a few examples. Are you ready? Citizenship. Money trail. 
even your money, your country's money, Indian currency, INR, is INR worth what it is worth today or should it be worth more or less? Do you know? You don't know, right? Do you know? You don't know. Okay, look at this. Look at this. Gold reserves of largest industrial nations. Where is India? Where? No, this is okay. Top 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Top 8 only I listed. Okay? India is somewhere in 10th, 11th ranking in the world. You have, you have gold. You have gold. Why is gold important? Just think about it for a while. Don't give me answer. But just think about why is this guy talking about gold now? Why, what is the relationship with blockchain or whatever is of, uh, this, this problem? What is all these things? Suddenly he threw us a gold bar. Yes. What's going on? Yeah, I want you to think about that. What's really going on? Okay. Look at this. Yeah. In 1944, in 1944, we all signed a treaty. The treaty was called Bretton Woods Agreement. Bretton Woods Agreement was signed in 1944. Guys, are you all following the story? We signed an agreement, a treaty. All the nations in the world, the first 44 nations in the world, they signed, 44 countries, in Mount Washington, they signed a treaty. And what is the treaty? You can have your Indian rupee, I can have my US dollar, I can have my doshma, I can have my real, whatever the currency you have, that's your business. But when we want the exchange value, we must have an agreed exchange ratio. What is the ratio? One dollar, how many US dollar, one rupee, how many, uh, you know, all these things. It's like the exchange ratio must be there, right? Without the exchange ratio, how to exchange money? So we agreed, we signed. 1944, look at all these people, look at all these, these people, some with hair, some no hair. But anyway, they all these people sat here, they all went to Mount Washington. They also represented from India as well. They went, they sat there and they set the standard, they set the standard. Look here, the gold standard was 35 US dollars an ounce of gold. Now today when we talk about gold, we talk about grams. Right? 8 grams is 1 pound. Right? Okay, how much is how much the price of gold per gram today? I don't know. Which one the ladies know better? So this side you win, you win. I know I know that all of you know one gram is how much today? I think you know, right? You don't know. Oh my god. Okay. Let me tell you. They are studying very hard, that's why they don't know. Okay. Okay. Majority, you win. Majority voice, 5,000 per grab. So I believe you. I don't know if I should believe you or not, but anyway, for the sake of discussion. Today, gold price is 5,000 according to the experts here. Per gram, 5,000 rupees, right? Nearly yeah, yeah, 5,000. I'm depending on my experts here, okay? So, anybody get angry, you score them. Don't tell me GST. GST. Including? GST. Including GST. Okay, thank you very much. 5,000. If you all don't accept this figure, please get angry with them. Nothing to do with me, okay? I'm just really think to you that there is value for gold today. Even until today, it's based on gold per gram so much, so much, right? Gold has always been the international standard for value. Even until today, you can you want to sell your car and you won't get the same value. You want to sell anything, you won't really properly get the proper value for it. But gold has always been the place where we Indians love to store value. Well, if you don't believe me, ask your grandmother. If you don't believe, ask her mother. Okay, is she still alive? Back from the those days until now. You know, I still remember my grandmother. She used to keep gold inside the, the container where they keep rice. 
Uh, I don't know why. Maybe she's hoping that one will become two, I don't know. You know? At the same time, my grandmother also used to put this marble, you know, this mango, inside the same place, inside the rice thing. I don't know why. So my grandmother said, no, you put it here, you know. Do they still practice until today? Yes, uh, you see? You see? I don't know what else you put inside there, but as long as you don't cook and eat it, it's fine. Okay? So, 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 so the, story, the, story of, the story of this goal, right, goes back to 1944. You see, many countries, I will come to this provenance very, very quickly because wealth has always been good. Do you agree? Storage of wealth has always, traditionally until today, been gold. Your mom and dad will tell you, don't buy a car, buy gold. Correct? Don't buy a motorcycle, but buy gold. Right? Isn't it? So are they wrong or right? They are actually right. You know why? It's the best place. It's the best place. Can you all hear me? Yes. Let's Too much interference. The people at the back there, can you hear me? No, sir. No. No, sir. So gold has always been the de facto standard for wealth. So if you are rich, you must have gold. Why? Because we signed the treaty. It didn't happen by accident. We signed the treaty, not we. 44 nations of the world signed this. You know, so we all agree that 35 ounces of gold will be used as the de facto standard for the value of your currency. Now, in recent times, in recent times, countries did not follow this thing. The problem, they don't follow. They simply print money when they want. But the money is not backed up by gold reserves. You see, I'm telling you, your wealth is based on not the money that you print, but the reserves that's backing up the value of your money, right? So that's why I showed you this graph. Among all the nations in the world, look at this country. Look guys, look at the United States. This is metric tons of gold. 8.133.5 metric tons. Metric tons. I'm not talking about grand... Uh, what, some of, okay, some of them, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about metric tons. So the richest nation in the world today this was 2014, even today they are still the richest nation in the world. Whatever you don't want to say about America is up to you. But in terms of gold, they are better than all of us. In terms of wealth, look, their population is very small. You are talking about 350 million people. For 350 million people, say how much gold they have. That's why the US dollar is so strong. You are proud of your Indian rupees because Mahatma Gandhi is there. Correct? But what about value? What about value? What about the value? It's not there. Why? Because you don't save enough money, in, you don't have enough wealth in gold. What happened? So when countries started printing money and there was no accountability and we wanted to know, just like the car example just now, you bought a car but you don't know whether that odometer is right or not, now I'm taking your currency but I really don't know. If your currency is worth what you say or not, I don't know. I want to be sure. So this was the problem that the blockchain is currently trying to resolve. There are many problems. This is one of the many problems. In your language, one of the use cases. Okay? Because you must use your language, then you understand. Okay, there are many use cases. One of the many use cases for the blockchain is about currency. So I'm going to teach you all something very, very, very interesting. I hope all of you become smarter by just learning these two words. Nominal, please repeat after me. Nominal. Nominal. Second one is face. Nominal value. Face 
value. You take a hundred rupee. What's printed on it is hundred, right? That is face value, but not nominal value. What it really is worth, we don't know. That's why I think I have very interesting conversations with my friend here, uh, Professor Ramesh, and he says, you know, tea used to be only like ten rupees back in the day. Then now you have to pay twenty or twenty-five rupees. Uh, for the same tea, okay. So what happened? You know, you're still giving the same money, but your buying power has become lot less. So, so the the face value is still ten rupees, twenty rupees, fifty rupees, whatever it is. But the nominal, the the the, the actual nominal value, what that money is worth, is much less. Why? Problem with this. Also, inflation, which is another problem. That one I have to take another two hours. I'm not going to bore you with that story. But the biggest problem is this: we don't have enough gold because gold can fight inflation. Okay, there's nothing better than gold for now. Okay, and this is not. I didn't say this. This is what the people in IMF are saying. Because in this year, in in this 2014, you can see this is the gold reserve in Asia. In Asia. You can see Russia, sorry, China and Japan are already there. Can you see Japan and China? Japan is very strong. China also, they are collecting a lot of gold. I don't know from where. But look at France. France, although they are very quiet, they have a lot of gold. Okay, Germany. Look. So this was the exchange rate in 1955. The exchange rate for one US dollar was 360 Japanese yen. One US dollar was 4.2 Dutch mark. You can see Dutch mark 4.2 for one US dollar, which is based on the 35 uh, the gram as I, as I mentioned to you. 35. This is 35 US dollars. So you can see here these two were the you know the exchange rate. So let's look at Japanese yen. 360 Japanese yen for one US dollar. 625 Italian lira. Italian lira for one US dollar. 4.2 Dutch mark for one US dollar, 2.8 pound for one US dollar, sterling pound. This was the exchange rate in 1955. Today, you also you can see, and over the years you can actually compare how the exchange rate moved up and down. One very interesting thing you will notice is that your currency will be feeling, feeling, feeling simply because not that currency has become better or anything, because they improve their reserve, which we. Back then, now we didn't really improve as much as they have. Everyone is improving, but some are improving better than others. That's why their currency is holding so much power. So, you remember I told you about this black money and money floating all over the place and all that, and then uh, Modi ji asked the money to be brought back and then demonetised all these stories. Why we want to have accountability of our money? Because some people just simply print no basis for the money. And now we want to see how much cash is there, how much gold is there. We want to do a matching. We want to do that accountability, which we couldn't do before. You see, your prime minister, what is doing? Smart or not, your prime minister? Of course, there were not many. There were a couple of prime ministers who are not very smart, but this prime minister is quite smart because he's saying we have this much gold, so we must only have this much money in circulation. Correct? Correct or not, guys? Come on. Uh, otherwise, how to determine the nominal values? No accountability, right? We simply floating around without any accountability. No, no accounts, no nothing to show. So what he is trying to do is, he is trying to figure out for this much money in circulation, how much gold we need, so that we can maintain this nominal value that we are talking about. That's his plan. Which many of you don't know, right? So now you learn something new. This is a good idea, right? So now we know how much money is floating. Now we have proper accountability. Remember, I told you. What did I tell you? Accountability problem and trust problem. We are trying to solve these using the blockchain. So I'm giving you real-world examples, not so much in blockchain programming or hyperledger and all that. That's something that we can do on a practical basis in another. Maybe in the future, but for now you must understand the concept. So inheritance is important. 
provenance is important, accountability is important, and all this leads to something called trust. And you need a way to document all these things. Currently, do you have? No. Even if you go to the Tassetar office, you only can check up to one or two generations. Maybe it's there or not there. So we, from, from beginning of time until now, we, the human race, never had enough documentation of everything and we cannot show provenance in a very clear way. And we want to solve this problem and we currently find this problem in currency. One of the areas we find is in currency. Okay? So look at this guys. So some slide like facts. This blockchain idea came about from a gentleman by the name of Mr. Nakamoto. Uh, and uh, I don't know, you like the name or not? Satoshi, Satoshi Nakamoto, Japanese? Yes, 2009. What year are we in today? Yeah, what year are we in today? How many years ago? How many years ago? Long time ago. This didn't happen yesterday. So if you still don't know much about blockchain, that means you are very far behind. Because this was already introduced way back and this guy created this thing by accident. He actually just wanted to have a proper documentation system and uh, he said, well, we have a lot of uh, currencies that are being printed uh, and but we don't know how to keep value. Then he thought a few use cases and he said, well, we need a technology to do this. And he came up with this idea by accident and suddenly the blockchain was born. Okay. He started thinking about end-to-end -end encryption of transactions, data security using hash codes. You all have learned hash coding in any, uh, you all learned some encryption before? Some encryption methods? Did you all learn? Yes? No? Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. So you all know any, do you all know Byzantine protocol? No sir. No, okay. So Byzantine protocol is what we use for this one, for the hash code. And, and, and we use a standard called SCTA-256. I will not go too much to the technical part because I want you to understand the concept and where we are going with this. Okay? So, this is how it works. It's actually based on a peer-to-peer -peer network. Alright? And you have a few blocks of data. Now, when you talk about blocks of data, usually when you keep data, you think of hardware or you think of a server, right? Where you store data. Okay, I want you to think of multiple storage places. So each one, each one of these is a peer in the network, and each peer can hold uh, trillions of petabytes of data. Okay, and all this data gets processed, and then it is stored in one place. I will show you an example, guys. Are you all, uh, are you all okay at the back there? No, no, no AC. No, no AC is this? Okay. So let's look at this example. Are you ready? When you buy a car, a brand new car, okay, there will always be a manufacturer, right? Who's the largest manufacturer of automobile in India? Are you sure? Okay, I don't know. Experts over here, what do you mean? Tata also. Okay, so okay. Both, both agree, okay. But yeah, okay. Anyway, so Tata, let's say, is the number one manufacturer. You are buying a car from Tata, brand new. What happens? What happens when you buy a car from Tata, brand new car, what happens? You are given a warranty book, you are given, uh, you know, all the documents, uh, and then the car goes through uh, a process where you need to insure the car. If you don't buy insurance, you cannot drive the car, right? First, you must also have driver's license. Okay, so there's a lot of other, there are a lot of what we call process owners for just one transaction of buying a car. Look at the number of process owners. Manufacturer, insurance, ownership and transfer, this is done by your road and transport department, I think. They will transfer ownership. If you're buying a car from a bank, you're taking a loan, then the, the ownership will be in the bank and then you will get your ownership once you pay the loan. Then there's the road and transport department that makes sure that the car is roadworthy. They will do some testing and everything, put a few stickers. Okay, the car is now ready. Register the car, give it a number plate. There's a lot of process, correct? Yes or no, right? Yes. Then you start driving the car. 
then you need to send a car of periodic service every 3,000 kilometers, 5,000 kilometers, whatever it is. If you don't, then the warranty is void, right? So all this is there, then the car goes through inspection again, 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 again. So just imagine, we are only talking about one, one simple thing like buying this car. Look at the problems here, okay? Now everybody will have all the information about this vehicle and that information is stored in this thing called a smart contract. This smart contract will be available in every process owner's ledger. So if anyone tries to change the odometer, it won't match the service history. Correct? You all know what I'm talking about? You all know what service history is? When you go to service a car, they will take the mileage on that day, you know, and time and all that, right? So it's all recorded, right? And when you buy the car, after you use this car for three or four years, you sold to someone else, whoever took that second-hand car, they try to modify the, let's say, the odometer, what happens? It won't match the sensitivity. It won't match what, the, what information we as process owners have in our ledger. This is how we trace provenance. So we have something called a smart contract within the blockchain, which will capture all the data of all the process owners and everyone will see the same data. If anyone try to go monkey the data by trying to change something, modify something, that data will get null and void and all of us will delete all the entries made. So in database also you learn, you know, something called asset properties, you know, in database. You learn, right? Uh, you all know it. Durability, atomicity. What does so atomicity, atomicity mean? All of, all of nothing. All of, all of nothing, right? You all know what's all or nothing? Okay, never mind. Another day, another day. See, these are fundamental things you must know. Your, so you go to ATM, you go to ATM machine, you put your ATM card, you try to withdraw money. I'm giving you a simple example of all or nothing. Okay? You put in 500 rupees, but the money didn't come out. Your card, you took out, money didn't come out. So by right, your account should be minus 500 or go back to the original. So if a transaction was cancelled or there was uh, some problem, then the database should go back to its original state. Right? So this is what we mean by all or nothing. It's either a 1 or a 0. Did the transaction happen or not? Complete binary, right? So this all or nothing principle, atomicity, is again applied here. If the data is modified by anybody, and if the data doesn't match all the other process owner, then that transaction will not be recorded in the ledger. And we can trace back all the way. Imagine today is 2022. We can trace all the way the history of the car from the day it was actually sold. That is the progress that we want. You will know who the previous owner was. You will know how many accidents the car had. You will know how many transactions happened, whether the car went into a flood or not. All this you will know before you even buy the car. This is the type of provenance we want to provide to you, not only for buying a car, buying a house. You know, sometimes people buy a house, you don't know the history of the house. Maybe someone hanged themselves and died in the house. Is it possible or not? <laughs> Nowadays, every day people are killing themselves. One IIT student killed himself. Then this morning I heard someone killed himself. Yesterday someone in Kerala killed himself. I don't know why people are killing themselves. <laughs> Maybe it's a trend today. You know, it's a trend, I think. Suicide. <laughs> they are on a suicide mission. Okay, anyway. Anyway. <laughs> Even the alarm agrees with me that people are in a suicide mission. <laughs> Every time I say something important, the alarm goes off. See? Has this happened before? Never, right? See, I told you. Even the alarm is telling you. My grandmother used to say, if the, if the, you know, the lizard, the lizard, right? my grandmother say, if that's been happening, it's very important. I don't know. You are dealing with the visa also? Yes, sir. My grandmother used to tell me. Anyway, anyway let's come back to provenance. But did you don't get the concept of provenance? Someone hanged themselves in the house. But the realtor is not going to tell you the story. They will clean up the place beautifully. 
and then they will do some makeup here and there, and then they will sell to you. You won't even know. Then, when you are sleeping that night, someone is getting to choke you. What is the problem? You know, there is something in the house you cannot see. So you bought something, you don't, you don't know the history, so provenance was not there. Do you all agree that provenance is important now? Provenance, very, very important. Do we have a technology today that provides the provenance? The answer is no. Can we trust human beings? The answer is no. But we need to trust a technology, the platform, because we cannot trust human beings, so we need to create a platform that is autonomous and it can take care of itself without any human intervention. And that is what the blockchain is all about. So forget the programming side and all that, that's another story, another day. But you get the concept around it. That's what we want to do, not only for currency, for purchase, for transaction, for banking, for money trade. Think about any area where you cannot trust human being and you know they will do some monkey job on the document. That's where you need this technology. Okay, and we have this smart contract. Okay, now it's the serious part. Those of you who are in computer science, listen to me very carefully. And IT people, listen to me very carefully. I'm only going to say this once. If you become a smart contract programmer, you will earn a lot of money. Sorry, that message is over. I hope all of you got the message. Smart contract coding, programming is the future. This is what I'm trying to explain from just now. Okay? All these are examples. But there's a there's a graph. But look here. Look. Decentralized finance. Can you all see this? This is where the big money comes, right? In the future. Sooner or later, banks are going to call you. Bank of Baroda, I don't know, maybe. I don't know. HDFC Bank or what? SPI Bank, whatever the bank may be, they will need people who have knowledge about how to write programs for smart contracts. Okay? So you will need to learn things like hyperledger. You will need to learn things like solid, solidarity or solidity. You need to learn all these things. The moment you learn all these things, guys, are you all going to story at the back? Yes or no? You all want to be rich or not? If you want to be rich, listen to me. Okay? What I'm telling you is of my observation of the market and industry. If you are not interested to be rich and famous, then don't listen. But if you want to be rich and famous, you want a career for yourself, if you care about your own career, then you will listen. Okay, simple as that. Some of you look to be, seem to be very busy talking to each other and all that stuff. It's okay. Because why should I care about your future, right? Who should care about your future? You or me? You should care about your future. Why do I care? I'm already rich. Why should I be standing here and wasting my time with you? So please listen carefully. Everything I say is important. Nothing about it is not important. So if you want to talk, please kindly go outside the building and talk and then come back. Okay? So let's move on. Look here. This is the first one. Okay? <coughs> Blockchain. We have finished the story on blockchain because here it's about this peer-to-peer -peer network and you have various ledgers that capture all this provenance. The provenance starts from this called the Gen Genesis block. Now if all of you know a little bit about Christianity, you probably know what Genesis is. Any Christians here? No. Okay. What was okay? What does Genesis mean? Okay, it's the first version of the Bible, first edition, right? In our language, we say first edition, right? Because we are all academic students. The first edition, the Hebrew, the Hebrew edition, Israel, you all know Israel? You all know the Jews? You all know that Jesus Christ was a Jew? Did you all know that? 
okay? The son of uh, the son of God or of Christ. He was a Jew, right? Yes, correct. Anybody got any doubts about that? Okay, correct. So you can ask that girl over there. She will tell you that Christ was a Jew. If you don't believe, Google believe. So when the first book was compiled for Christianity, it was called Genesis, the first book. Then of course many other books came. So we took this concept of Genesis from actually that book, like the origin, the first place. So the first place we keep data is called the Genesis block. Okay? So the Genesis block is the most important block in the block. <coughs> And then after that, you have various blocks that are connected to the Genesis. And can you see the arrow? Referring back, referring back, referring back, referring back. This is where the prominence happens. All the way to the source of the Genesis. So if you bought your car for the first time, the first transaction of the car will be in the Genesis block. And then every other block here will capture the transaction of the car bought and sold, bought and sold, bought and sold that many times. So you can always trace back to the Genesis. Okay? So like today you are buying a piece of land and then the guy says this land is now uh, so many crores, let's say. The person says this is the value of the land today. So you ask the person, what was the land price in 1920? Can you imagine, you can trace all the way back. So you also know whether you are paying an economic value or the price of the land is overpriced. You will know. See in a lot of places in the world, when you buy a piece of land is willing buyer, willing seller, right? Willing buyer will say, this, uh, you know, can you sell it to me this price? The seller will say, okay, you take this price, then they will negotiate, negotiate, they will meet halfway, right? Yes? Or some sellers who are very tough guys, they will say, no, I don't care. You take it or leave it, this is the price. Okay, but you want to know, are you paying a fair price for that piece of land or not? At the moment, you don't know. Do you want to know you are paying a fair price or not? Yes or no? But you don't have provenance, how will you know? So now, we are actually using this for all land titles as well. Land titles, all the way back to the original, the first day the land was registered. So nobody is going to take your land and sell. Because we will have all the documentation that points that you and your father were the owners of this land. Two, three generations you have had the land. We need the provenance. We need this kind of data, guys. Do you all agree we need this or not? Provenance is important. And this is managed on a peer-to-peer -peer network and every process owner will have every process owner will have in their respective smart contracts a portion of the data that represents what is relevant to them. So manufacturer will have their data, insurance company will have their data. If the car has been in an accident and insurance claim has already been made, that will already show. So you cannot sell the car as a car that's never been in an accident before. Because when you trace back all the way to Genesis block, the Genesis block will tell you this is the information. And then you know 10 years later, 20 years later, 30 years later, you can actually trace all the way back. So this transaction history, records, inheritance, whatever you want to call it, provenance, is what this first technology does for you. So I think I will conclude the first technology by showing you this slide. For all of you, until now, if you don't believe that the blockchain is already here, if you don't believe that the blockchain, uh, you know, is going to provide you with that kind of, a, you know, technology and support, just look at this graph, okay? Look, in 2015, there was only 75 market, 75 US dollars uh, in million, eh? 75 million US dollars in 2015 was given to blockchain as market cap, that means investments in this area, companies that invested in blockchain, 2015, 75 million, just over uh, four, four years, just over four years, you can see 75 million has grown up to 400 million. So we are not joking with you, this is real. A lot of companies are investing in technology, especially when you're looking at vaccines, you want to know where they originate from, where they came from, you have a vaccine certificate, right? You want to check the authenticity of your vaccine certificate, origin, where it came from, whether or not you took the right vaccine. All this provenance is important. Okay, so provenance can be applied in many areas if you got the concept. And if you learn this technology, you will be okay. And last point, there are three types of blockchain. You have a hybrid blockchain, you have a private blockchain, and you have a 
public blockchain. Of all these three blockchain, you can see the purple one public has actually increased the cumulative average growth rate of this from the year 2015 prediction until 2024. We are predicting the growth by 32%. This is another indication for you that this is a very important subject. Okay? So if you still are not convinced, look at this data and tell yourself where what you should be studying. From now on, reset. Okay, I'm studying many things, they're all important. But where's my focus? You should start looking at it. Okay? So among this public blockchain, 32%, see much of it actually belongs to financial services. So things that are related to money, things that are related to currency, the one that I was talking about, the Prime Minister's effort and all that, is financial services, transportation will be part of it, healthcare, and the <coughs> telecoms, consumer products will also be part of that. Okay? So these are all very hot industries. Think about it. Finance, banking, transportation, think about it. It's going to be hot, especially now. Okay? Financial services, all these e-wallets, cryptocurrency, these are all moving in this area. So, it's a decentralized technology. We use very high uh, encryption standards. We have a principle called proof of work. That means if someone tries to monkey the data, the data becomes obsolete. Uh, we use something called smart contract. And then this is Turing complete. So, just Google what Turing complete is, and probably you will understand what it is. I don't have time to define it for you, okay? We are running short of time, I think. Yeah, we have to fast forward. Okay, by the way, we are using that many, many, many use cases. Look at this. Digital currency, land registration, voting. Many countries are actually as using blockchain for this uh, purposes. So you look at the green one. The green one basically is in progress. Number one, look at number one. This is digital currency. So Canada has already done digital currency. Denmark, digital currency. Can you see? India. Look at India. Also plan to do digital currency. China. So these are all the number ones. Then moving to number two, land registration. You can see Illinois, land registration. You can see Brazil, land registration. You can see also here Sweden, land registration, Ghana. These are countries that are doing, uh, you know, using blockchain for these different purposes. So sooner or later, when you vote, elections comes, you know, the voting results will basically flow on the blockchain. Land registration programs will go back to blockchain. All this that requires programs and trust will go back to blockchain. So that's my first uh, technology. Since I took so much time for first technology, I'm going to go very fast in the second and third and fourth one. Okay? So now I'm going to go running 100 meters. Are you ready? Generative AI. So generative AI, for a long time in the healthcare sector, we try to, you know, we talk about digital, digital images. Okay, you talk about reconstruction of images. When you take an X-ray, you only get two dimensional data, right? X-ray. Then when you go for MRI, you get a slightly more, uh, you know, uh, depth of the image. The, the depth of the image is higher. The DPI is higher. Then you can also look at veins, not just bones. So MRI gives you better depth than X-ray. X-ray just at the bone density level. But when you want to look at veins and all that, you have to look at. Uh, uh, the MRI scan, right? So these scan images also have limitations. Sometimes, if the if you do compression and decompression of these images, there will be a lot of uh, loss in the data, right? So we talk about lossless and lossy compression techniques and all that you have learned, right? Okay. Now all of these problems, we have a solution now, and the solution is called. Generative AI. We are using generative AI to reconstruct the image. Or if you don't understand anything I told you, imagine you had a picture from 1945, your grandmother's face is only half there. The other half of your grandmother's face is missing. You can use generative AI to reproduce how your grandmother would have looked like, you know, in 1945. So imagine old documents and all that, you can reconstruct them. So we are using this technology to reconstruct because machines will learn the pixels of the original picture and reconstruct slowly it will build. Layer by layer it will build and give you a new picture. 
We can also do this for MRI images. We can also do this for X-ray images. We can also use this for brain scan. I'm using a lot of this for brain scan. Uh, I can't show you now, but uh, maybe you know sometime later I'll show you. the brain brain scan images. Uh, Professor Ramesh uh, has seen my brain pictures. I got a lot of pictures of the brain, all MRI images, and I'm using this to reconstruct. We are reconstructing for checking uh, tumor growth in the brain. So we are looking at cancer of the brain and we are trying to understand how this tumor is affecting the brain and over time we are actually trying to understand the pattern and even predict where this tumor will go next. Okay? So especially this frontal cortex, right? You all know this is called the frontal cortex of your brain. This is where your speech and all this comes. If you have a tumor here, you will, you will stop being able to see, you won't be able to see, you won't be able to talk. That's how fragile the human body is. Okay? So we are slowly understanding how cancer is spreading inside the brain and we are looking at the morphing images, the morphing of the images we are using generative AI. Okay? So you all know what morphing is, right? If you watch Terminator, you know what morphing is. So the guy from liquid becomes man, right? Okay, that's a, that's a kind of morphing. It's called morphing, uh, morphing uh, image. So the, the guy is running, suddenly gets shot, and then he comes back in human, right? It's all morphing technology, but that's used in multimedia. We are using morphing with generative AI, so that we can tell you, today the tumor is like this. Tomorrow, ten, five years from now, the tumor is going to look like this. Okay, how do we do that? That modeling, we use past patient history data, and we use the prediction. So it's a little bit of data science, it is a little bit of image processing, a little bit of morphing in there. So many areas of computer science in one field of science. Okay? So your, the radiologists and all that, they have no time to read and interpret images. With this technology, genetic AI, we can actually do that. And we are looking about scaling the data. For video scaling, we can go up to 60 frames per second. This is really an enormous uh, breakthrough. Uh, we can use for X-ray, MRI, cancer prediction, basically even for design improvement. And lastly here, for speed of coding. Generative AI can also be used for coding purposes. Okay, so it takes you, I don't know how long it takes you to write a code. Uh, let's say I'm talking about 1,000 line of code, right? So that 1,000 line of code, how long will it take you to, you know, from start to finish? Complete, uh, forget about the compiling all that, just to write uh, without error. How long does it take? 1000 line of code. Tell me. One day. Are you sure? One day by copying, maybe. You know? <laughs> by, by, by yourself, I don't think so. So, so. so, let's not joke with each other, okay? Let's get serious. It takes a while. Even for the best programmers, it takes a while because you have to contextualize before you start writing. Correct? And then you must know what kind of libraries you can use, what you cannot use, what will work, what you don't work, but you must know what you want to build first before you even and you have to work backwards, right? Now in generative AI, you just say what you want. You just take what you want and the AI will help you to write the code for you. Then you can modify. So basically, it's like reverse engineering using some AI technology to help you to uh, create the code faster compared to you just depend on yourself. Okay? So a lot of you use GitHub. I know you download a lot of data from Kaggle and all that. Uh, don't believe any of those things because all those things haven't been really tested. Okay? Stop using Kaggle data from today onwards. A lot of bugs, a lot of errors. I know, secondary data you all download from Kegel, right? Stop using that. A lot of errors inside the code. Start collecting your own data. Whether it is uh, primitive, you may think, and in slow, you may think, but uh, this kind of data, um, because, you know, garbage in, garbage out, right? So if the data is wrong, you're going to get wrong result. So why you go and waste your time there? Even your data set is small, but because you know the exact source of the data, you'll, you'll get better results. So start thinking about primary data source. Don't go for this data and you have the model. Okay? And this one is just to help you in the coding part. Next 
emerging technology number three is homomorphic encryption. So if you talk about encryption, there's only two steps. One is encrypt, the other one is decryption, right? Uh, so imagine adding new data to encrypted data was never possible, right? You have to decrypt first, then you can add data, and then you encrypt again. Now imagine a technology where you can add new things to encrypted data without decryption. That's what this is all about. Data already encrypted, guys. If you want to add anything or make changes, we have to decrypt first. That's how that's how it was in the past. Then add new information, then encrypt again, right? That's how it was before. Now not anymore. At the encryption state itself, you can add new data, and that philosophy is homomorphic encryption. Okay? Are you alright with homomorphic? Does it sound like Star Wars to you or what? Okay? Anyway, I'll show you some formulas. I'm not going to go through the formulas. Okay? This is how we actually run through this uh, homomorphic because we go by, you know, the data points and they're all binary, of course, and we write certain codes and then we do some mapping. I think you would have done this in your networking class if I'm not mistaken. Some of you have done uh, theorems on Dijkstra. Uh, I don't know what you learned, I don't know what you learned, but um, you, would have, you would have seen this node-to-node uh, -node exchange on a, on a, on a Dijkstra theorem, right? How many of you know Dijkstra's theorem? Okay, you don't know, okay, then forget about this. Okay, we move on to the last one. The last champion that I want to talk about is IoT. So IoT, as all of you probably know, uh, is an emerging technology, very, very useful technology. I'm just going to share some data with you so that you can see. See, back in 1988, on somewhere in 1992, the IoT thought of putting IoT was into your PCs and back then we didn't call PC, we called desktop. <laughs> back then we used the term desktop. There was no, there was no personal computer at that time. Desktop computer. Then personal computer became, uh, you know, after Microsoft all came, it changed. Same thing, but we call it a personal computer. So the inception of this, or the idea of this, was to connect devices. Look at this, one million devices in 1992, 1 million devices had IOTs in them and that was in the field of uh, desktop computers. Today, look at this, what is this guys? What's this? It's what you find in your house, uh, yeah, your house door handle, right? Now even your door handle, such a small thing as an IOT uh, component in it. Back then, 1 million, Today we are talking about 50 billion. Look at the growth, look at the growth of how IoT has spread out. Some of you are wearing watches, which are smart watches, you have smartphones, you have smart shoes, I don't know, anybody wearing smart shoes? So uh, where the shoe will tell you how many steps you took today, whether you fulfill your, your gym criteria for the day or not, 10,000 steps, whatever it is. You know, people want to monitor the pulse rate, heartbeat, I don't know. I don't know for what. If they do, do some work, it's all there. Okay, why do you want to monitor? I don't understand. Okay? Um, and then people think it's cool to have a, a digital watch to monitor all these things. How they be monitored? Through sensors. Where are the sensors? They are inside these devices. Who put them in? We, the manufacturers, put them in. In everything, including a light bulb. Look at it. We put in every single thing. You know, traffic light, everything we put in sensors. In IOTs are everywhere. Constantly collecting data. How many steps you took? What's your heartbeat? What's your pulse rate? Samsung will know about your health better than any hospital in the world because you're wearing a Samsung watch, you have a Samsung smartphone, and you have enabled uh, you know, the health detector. So maybe even your doctor won't have so much data, but Samsung will have more data about your health, how your heart performance has been in the last six months, right? So because of this IoT, right? Look, 2020, they already reached 50 billion devices, by 2030, I don't know, probably you're looking at more than the population of the planet, okay? Maybe 100 times the population of the planet or 200 times the population of the planet. We have, we have only about what? How many billion people in the world? We're talking about India and China, 
is 50 percent of the world's population. There's almost uh, 3 billion there, and then we have another 3 billion. Almost 6.5 billion people in the world. But look at how many IoT devices are there. Okay, it's like four or five times the world's population. In another 10 years, it will be like 200 times the world's population. 300 times. So we'll have more IoT devices than human beings, guys. Think about it. That's where we are going with this thing. Okay. So in my research, I do a lot of work in aircraft technology, uh, where sensors in aircraft. So these are some images of the aircraft and where I put the sensors. So I want to know how much uh, air is coming from the aircon vent. I want to know how far you lean your chair. You know, I want to know what is the op optimal uh, space between the chair in front of you and the chair behind you in a business class or in an economy class. And we are doing a lot of different configurations on the plane. Okay? So, if you can see here, generally in terms of, in terms of aircraft, we have two types of aircraft. And the one is called wide body, the other one is called narrow body. Uh, why wide body is because when you come from here to here, right? Can you see? Can you see from here to here? Look at the picture at the bottom here. This is the wide body aircraft. Can you see the picture here? The people at the back can't see anything, right? So you will have two seats, then you will have three seats, then you will have another two seats. So across from left to right, you are looking at about seven seats uh, across. This is called wide body aircraft. Okay? If you are looking at two seats, then one small space for them to push the trolley and then other two seats, this is called a narrow body aircraft. Dimension of aircraft is different. So we, the IoT guys, we put all the sensor in the different parts of the aircraft to do many different configurations for the aircraft. One of the things we found out was, if you go and sit in a plane, you will see that there's in front there's a seat in front of you, there will be a seat in front of you, you are sitting here, and below the seat there's one metal piece that you can press down. How many of you have been in a plane before? Not yet. Okay. So one person has been in a plane, two people. Did you all notice that there is a metal piece at the bottom of the seat? Okay. So this metal piece is hardly used by passengers because our IoT data tells us that nobody uses the metal piece to push it down and to rest your feet. Nobody uses it. Why? Because the seat is too narrow. Okay. In economy class, in a narrow body aircraft. So we know that each each piece, uh, each metal piece weighs about four and a half pounds. And you multiply the four and a half pounds uh, by 450 chairs, that's additional weight in the aircraft, okay, that you don't need because people are not using, not using that, that metal piece. So we, we spoke to the Federal Aviation Authority and we said that our data says that people are not using this metal piece. So we can remove it from the chair. Is it okay? Is, is it against any safety regulation of your Federal Aviation Authority? We said no, no problem, you can remove. So we got all the uh, aircraft reconfigured for low cost carriers. You all know low cost carrier? Low cost carrier are, are airlines that charge you very cheap prices for tickets. So if I want to be cheap in my pricing, I have to reduce my operational cost. In order to reduce my operational cost, I need to know what is my operational cost. So for aircraft, most of the cost is actually fuel related. And we burn a lot of fuel on takeoff. Takeoff is where you burn a lot of fuel. And if your aircraft is heavy, what happens? Heavy aircraft burns more fuel, right? If you burn more fuel, it's more cost. When you have more cost, you make less profit. If you make less profit, how to give you cheap ticket? So based on the optimization formula, we came up with several options. One of it is to remove the, the, the you know the, the footrest, the metal footrest, and we reduce that, and we were able to minimize uh, additional 30% of the cost for fuel. Okay, then we started analyzing baggage. Okay, so we made you pay for baggage. Then we made we created a new tariff code for baggage. So we know most of the time these this aircraft don't make much money from the passengers. We make more money from the cargo. So we expanded the cargo space and we uh, adjusted the, the seating places. So all our aircraft after this study 
they were reconfigured to a certain way so that we can actually make more money. Uh, and and that's a simple that's in a simple way. Of course, very complicated. But I'm trying to simplify the concept for you so that you can understand. See, you you know coding, you know IoT, but you don't know the business problem. How are you going to help us? So when, when I went and saw the airline, they told me, I have a problem, I need to save money, I need to reduce my operational cost. How you can you help us with IoT? So that's how I had to spend many, many years learning about aircraft. I don't know anything about aircraft. I had to spend so much time learning about aircraft. Then we designed our own IoT devices. We are also using them in farming. This is a farming example. So what we did was, for the aircraft, we collected data over 168 destinations. 25 countries, 15 years we collected this data and we were able to do it for narrow and wide body and after some time we got this uh, very interesting result. If you look at all the aircrafts here, Lufthansa, Air China, British Airways, EVA, SIA, they are all above this line. You know what this line is? This line is the average cost line. In the, in the aviation, in aviation, the cost of your cost is measured in, in terms of ASK. Just now we talked about gold, right? Gold, the unit of measure is what? Uh, we are talking about grams. Grams, right? For unit of measure. For, for storage, unit of measure is kilobyte, megabyte, you know, the BYTE, right? That's what we use for unit of measure. And unit of measure for speed will be kilometers per hour. Unit of measure for cost for airline is ASK. Average or available seat per kilometer ASK, which is the unit cost. So after we did all this, can you see this company here, Air Asia, the bottom here? Air Asia was the only one who could produce at the unit cost of 0.023 cents per ASK per kilometer per seat per kilometer was the lowest in aviation industry. That was, some, that was our success story.